Hey everybody, welcome to my first episode of my first how-to. I'm going to be building a Tamiya 132nd scale F4EJ from the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force. The model will be posed just after liftoff, nearly level, and accelerating for a low transition for a max performance takeoff. So it'll be posed with the leading edge flaps and nose gear up and retracted, while the main mounts will almost be up and the trailing edge flaps too. For a little more interest, I'll include a little roll correction. So one aileron will be down slightly and the opposite spoiler will be slightly raised. It'll be sitting on a small post over a runway base that I intend to do the blurred effect to. So it should look pretty great and I'm looking forward to seeing the finished project. I have some specific goals in mind for this build in an effort to expand my skill set. My main challenge will be electronics. I'll be adding lighting and sound to the model and with any luck, some form of wireless control. I really want to build an app for my phone and control the model functions via Bluetooth. All right, it's time to get going and build the pilots, Pine and Bob, and their ejection seats. Pine and Bob are the call signs of the fighter bubbles whose names are painted on the jet I've chosen to model. The jet's markings will be a Japanese Air Self-Defense Force special scheme from the 302nd Squadron. It was painted up after winning the air combat meet in 2007. After getting the bodies, arms, and helmets off the sprues, I turned my attention to the helmet. This is my helmet! There are many like it, but this one is mine! The oxygen mask is molded appears to be a very old type, 70s era or earlier, so it's got to be modified to match my references. I started by scribing the details of the joints of the helmet. The top edge underneath the visor and the leather padding around the lower area of the helmet. I'm really just trying to deepen the joints here to maybe get a little bit of shadow line, but ultimately to make it easier to paint. I then started removing the molded in mass straps and buckles or attachy thingy or whatever the manufacturer had in their mind. I used a diamond file, scalpel, and chisel tip blade to remove most of the offending plastic. There's a lot of back and forth with the tools. Shave off a bit here, file spot smooth, chisel edges back in until slowly I sculpted the shape I was happy with. After the carving was complete, I then rescribed in a mask outline around the face, so basically the lower edge of the mask and the lower edge of the visor so I could recover its shape. For those wondering, the scribing tool I'm using is a stainless steel rod. If I remember correctly, it was a bicycle spoke, and I put it on a grinder and sharpened it to a point. It ended up being quite a bit of work, and I think if I were to tackle another helmet, I'd draw one up in CAD and print some up. I know some of you say that's cheating, maybe so, but there are enough symmetrical components and details that the part really would be better printed. Luckily on this model, the parts were small enough and I got lucky and the minor differences from side to side are really difficult to detect. And once the paint was on, I think they look pretty good. And I know a lot of you are asking, was this really worth all the effort? Couldn't you have just painted it up? Sure, I could have done that. But knowing that the helmets are one of the main parts that you'll see when the canopies are closed, I wanted to focus and make sure that those were as right as I could get them. Moving on to the bodies, it was pretty straightforward modeling. If you've removed parts from sprues, cut off sprue gates, and removed seam lines, well, that's pretty much what's going on here. I will say that the narrow tapered diamond file did a good job of chasing out clothing wrinkles and refining details. As I did with the helmet, I used my scribing tool to carve into the joints of the pilot body. Specifically, I spent time separating the torso harness, the G-suit, and the flight suit collar. In some places, I used a small saw to get a more pronounced undercut. 
Bob had some minor modifications. For one, he had a double arm transplant. If I'd used the kit arms, it would look like Bob was trying to fly the jet. And if I let that happen, Pine would be like, Bob, I said my aircraft. You touch the controls one more time and you be flying Gomo Uno no Tawagato out of Hong Kong. So in the interest of keeping peace between the two of them, Bob got new arms. Bob also got a kneeboard fashioned from 20 thou plastic and aluminum tape for a leg strap and a sheet of paper. The arm joint on both Pine and Bob were dressed with epoxy putty and shaped to match the wrinkles of the flight suit with a wet tool. I added some details to Pine and Bob's flight suits. I started with the fuzzy Velcro, that's technically the loop half of Velcro. I simulated that with aluminum tape, adding little rectangles to both shoulders. And then I formed patch shapes with epoxy putty. I only put the patches on pine. I didn't worry about Bob because you really won't be able to see his shoulders once he's enclosed in the cockpit. Here's a pro tip. Once all the scribing and the plastic cutting was complete, I flooded on some zip kicker, which is a super glue accelerator. The fluid is just hot enough to slightly melt the edges and removes any stubborn scribing dust. And by the way, Zip Ran is the only one that I've found to do this magic. At this point I started adding details to the helmets. I started with the bayonets and receivers for the O2 mask. Here's a shot of my own personal helmet and O2 mask. You can see the way the parts function on the real thing. The Japanese helmets are slightly different from mine, but not different enough that you'd notice it in 1 32nd scale. So the parts I'll be fabricating for now will be the bayonets and the receivers. I laid on a small sheet of epoxy putty onto the side of the helmet, and then removed the excess material and created the bayonet shape. I used tools that were just slightly damp to remove the excess and create the shape. Working with epoxy is a bit of a dance, that you've got to use water to keep the epoxy from sticking to the tools, but if you use too much water, then it won't stick to the part. So there's a good bit of back and forth and fussing to get the epoxy to stick just right. Another small lump was added over the bayonet to simulate the receiver. I added a strip of aluminum tape and a small styrene punch circle for the visor track and locking nub. A little JB weld was mixed up and I used that to create the screw heads on the side of the visor cover. Moving on to the seats. I'll only be adding details from the parachute pack up. The rest of the seat won't be seen so I really didn't bother detailing them further down. Starting with the parachute pack, as molded, the pack is just a nondescript horseshoe shaped bit of plastic, so we gotta add some details. For the parachute cover that makes up the top quarter of the pack, it was covered in heavy duty kitchen foil and adhesive from metal leaf. The bungees on the sides of the pack, the trim, the risers, and various other cloth details were all made with aluminum tape. 
The seat is now ready for assembly. The small hole was first filled, then the seat cushions and the parachute pack were glued together. I also added a strip of styrene to represent the shelf that the parachute pack sits on. I then added the first part of the parachute risers that wrap around the parachute pack. At the top of the seat where the parachute risers attached to the drogue chute, the risers pinched down into a triangle shape. This portion was made with epoxy putty. A small piece of lead wire was used to create a buckle, and then the epoxy was added, carefully shaped so it appeared to be wrapping around the buckle. At this point, it's time to sling some paint. The parts were primed with a two-part paint with a separate hardener, referred to as 2K paints. The primer I'm using is a DTM epoxy primer. DTM stands for direct to metal. And I really like this stuff for two reasons. One is the name applies it bonds to metal, so that I get a good bond to the bare metal surfaces of the aluminum tape. And two, it's literally a glue, so it helps bond dissimilar materials together. That way I don't have to solely rely on the adhesive of the aluminum tape and the epoxy putty. Especially the epoxy putty bond, because the putty forms better when it's partially cured, but the epoxy bond to the plastic gets weaker as a result. And so for this reason I decided to prime the helmets now, even though they weren't complete, just to make sure I got that epoxy putty to stick. At this point the seats are ready for final coats of paint and the helmets are ready for the next layer of detail. Not much left to do on the helmets. I completed it with the straps that connect the O2 mask to the bayonets. I just used thin aluminum tape and a few bits of punch styrene for screw head details. And the helmets were primed again. So then I turned to the finished painting. On Pine and Bob, I made a concerted effort to give them the figure painted treatment. That is to try to add shades and highlight. In the past, I've just painted figures with solid colors thrown on a wash or oil paint which I quickly wiped off and called the shadows good. I've always just used my normal paints which are a combination of Guns and Tamiya. So for me, step one was to acquire some new paints. I was after some acrylics for figure painting. I ended up getting one of the Army Painters paint sets and a secondary set of their washes. I also got some brushes and a wet palette to play with. Off camera, I painted up Bob to get the feel for the paints and color choices. When it was Pine's turn, I had the process worked out well enough for me. At first I was mixing up multiple shades of one color and trying to paint individual shades and highlights. I found the details were just too small for this to work well. Or it could have been me that I just really don't paint figures much and I was kind of struggling early on. I ended up going back to my old ways. However, the Army Painter paints and washes really made for better results than my previous efforts. So here's my process, and this is in no way meant to be a tutorial. Figure painting is just not my thing, and I don't do it often, and good painting takes practice. I chose to use colors straight out of the bottle, and if I had to mix a color, I didn't worry about lighter or darker variations. I then used the washes primarily the green with a little bit of brown and black shades. I really like the Army Painter washes. They tinted the paint like a filter and made nice smooth shading. Then I could use the thinned original color to add some highlight. I was still experimenting a little bit when I painted pine. So you'll see coats of paint go on and then in some instances I added wash and then painted new pieces. So you'll kind of see that where I painted the, the flight suit, the G suit, and part of the uh, equipment vest. I added wash to those parts, and then you'll see I go in and paint the belts of the torso harness with light gray, and I added wash after that as well. 
And then I turned to all the little detail painting, like painting the gray of the gloves and the patch colors. And I just painted those to be representative. I wasn't trying to get exact match. Just a hint of color here and there that looks a little bit like the patches that I saw in my references is good enough. And the seat's got the exact same treatment. Then the ejection rings were painted up. They start out with a coat of yellow paint and then wrapped with a thin strip of masking tape. I shot on another very light coat of yellow paint to seal up the edges of the tape, followed by a very light, thin coat of tire black. After the basic painting was completed, I strapped Pine and Bob into their seats. Each of them got four strips of aluminum tape, two running from the shoulders to the seat at the horseshoe-shaped opening of the parachute pack. The other two strips are risers to the parachute pack and they went from the shoulders right up to the top of the pack. Oxygen hoses were fashioned from multiple sizes of lead wire a fatter wire wrapped by two strands of thinner lead wire, and they were wrapped completely tight so that there were no gaps. Then one of the wires was carefully unwound to give a nice even spacing, simulating the ribs of the oxygen hose. I also added a couple bits of lead wire. These are the attachments for the drug chute to the drug chute gun and then the drug chute to the parachute risers. The last detail was some decals for the helmets. White decals are printed up on clear decal paper with my very ancient Alps MicroDry printer, which can print white. The decals were then cut out and applied to the helmet and settled down with a little bit of Microsol. Once dry and with plenty of magnification, hence this process is not on film, clear yellow was painted over the decals. By no means did I exactly paint over the decal. There was some paint on the gray helmet but the overpaint is so minimal and the decals are so small that the overpaint is not really visible. If anything, it looks like a bit of shadow and highlights the decal. 
And first up for the outdoorsman, it's young Candace Despiseman. She's a spelunker. Oh, she vomits for a living? She's a cave diver. Oh, took a dive right there. So that's it for now. I enjoy messing around with my new paints, and I really hope you like the results. And maybe you learned a thing or two. Or maybe I just entertained you a little bit. The cockpit will be next, and I've got a bit of fiber optics and some LEDs, so I'll be working out how to light up the inside of the cockpit along with assembling and painting it. I hope you tune in for that episode. And finally, please leave a like, comment if you didn't, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, everybody.